O God, you are my God. I earnestly search for you. My soul thirsts for you. My whole body longs for you in this parched and weary land where there is no water. I have seen you in your sanctuary and gazed upon your power and glory. Your unfailing love is better than life itself. How I praise you. I will praise you as long as I live, lifting up my hands to you in prayer. You satisfy me more than the richest feast. I will praise you with songs of joy. I lie awake thinking of you, meditating on you through the night. Because you are my helper, I sing for joy in the shadow of your wings. I cling to you. Your strong right hand holds me securely. This is the word of the Lord. Father God, we just pray for Helen this morning as she brings your word to us. We just thank you for all the preparation that she has put into it. And we just pray that, uh, again, that we will hear what we need to hear through her this morning. Amen. Thank you, Helen. Thank you. It's a little bit bright. Can we just turn that light down a bit up there? I'm getting a bit... Well, shall I move? I'm getting a... Um, all right, today is Pentecost Sunday, as we've already heard this morning, and it's the day when we remember when the Holy Spirit descended on the disciples as they waited in Jerusalem, just as Jesus had told them to do, and they were waiting for what had been promised. Now, I'm sure you'll be very familiar with many of the passages about the Holy Spirit. Many of them are in the book of Acts, which is correctly called the Acts of the Apostles, but it's often renamed as the Acts of the Holy Spirit. But the Holy Spirit is mentioned and active throughout Scripture, right from Genesis 1, where the Holy Spirit was brooding over the water in the beginning, to the book of Revelation in the last few verses where it says, the Spirit and the Bride say, come. So there's really a lot we could think about this morning. But we're going to focus on our relationship with the Holy Spirit today, learning something from those first disciples waiting for something in Jerusalem 2,000 years ago. So just to put those events of Pentecost in context, Jesus had been crucified, he had risen from the dead, and many of the believers had witnessed his resurrection appearances. He descended into heaven, and the believers were gathered together at this special Jewish feast of Pentecost, which is about five weeks after Passover or Easter waiting in Jerusalem for something to happen. And you can read all about it in Acts 1 and 2. But the first indication in the New Testament that uh, the first disciples should expect something new is a bit earlier in the Gospel of John. And if we read the familiar passages about the coming of the Holy Spirit, we can begin to see a pattern. So in John 14, just before he was crucified, Jesus was speaking to his disciples about what would happen when he'd left. It says, he says, if you love me, obey my commandments, and I will ask the Father, and he will give you another advocate who will never leave you. He is the Holy Spirit who leads into all truth. The world cannot receive him because it isn't looking for him and doesn't recognize him, but you know him because he lives with you now and later will be in you. They probably didn't really know what he was on about. And you can perhaps imagine as they were sitting around in that upper room, having shared the Last Supper, turning to one another and sort of saying, what's he, what's he on about? What's he talking about? And we can understand from our point of view, 2,000 years later, exactly what he was on about. Um, but they, did, they didn't really understand, but they did understand there was something more to come. Moving forward just a few days and Jesus has been crucified and then miraculously has defeated death and appears to his disciples. He tells them to wait in Jerusalem because there was something more to come. In Acts 1 we read, On one occasion while he was eating with them, he gave them this command, 
Do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift my father promised, which you have heard me speak about. For John baptised with water, but in a few days you will be baptised with the Holy Spirit. Then they gathered round him and asked him, Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom to Israel? He said to them, It is not for you to know the times or dates the Father has set by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. And of course we know that they still didn't truly understand what he was talking about. They still had an idea that he was going to restore a political kingdom. Nevertheless, they were obedient because a few weeks later, we read in Acts 2, on the day of Pentecost, all the believers were meeting together in one place. Suddenly there was a sound from heaven like the roaring of a mighty windstorm, and it filled the house where they were sitting. Then what looked like flames or tongues of fire appeared and settled on each of them. And everyone present was filled with the Holy Spirit and began speaking in other languages as the Spirit gave them this ability. So finally, they had received the something more that Jesus had promised, the gift of the Holy Spirit. But people, you know, looking on, and even themselves, they didn't really understand what was happening. Some thought the believers were drunk. But Peter explained, and he used the words of the Old Testament prophet Joel, who says, Then, after doing all those things, I will pour out my Spirit upon all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy, your old men will dream dreams, and your young men will see visions. In those days I will pour out my Spirit, even on servants, men and women alike, and I will cause wonders in the heavens and on the earth, blood and fire and columns of smoke. The sun will become dark and the moon will turn red, before that great and terrible day of the Lord arrives. The something more that they had been told to expect and had been waiting for had come. And then this pattern of something more continues throughout the rest of the book of Acts. In Acts 8 it says, When the apostles in Jerusalem heard that the people of Samaria had accepted God's message, they sent Peter and John there. As soon as they arrived, they prayed for these new believers to receive the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit had not yet come upon any of them, for they had only been baptised in the name of the Lord Jesus. Then Peter and John laid their hands upon these believers, and they received the Holy Spirit. And even the Apostle Paul had to wait three days after his dramatic encounter with Jesus on the road to Damascus to receive that something more. So Sir Ananias went and found Saul. He laid his hands on him and said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus, who appeared to you on the road, has sent me so that you might regain your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. Instantly, something like scales fell from Saul's eyes, and he regained his sight. Then he got up and was baptized. Afterwards, he ate some food and regained his strength. Paul stayed with the believers in Damascus for a few days. And immediately he began preaching about Jesus in the synagogue, saying, He is indeed the Son of God. So many of them had to wait for that something more. And the gift of the Holy Spirit, that something more, is not just for people 2,000 years ago in New Testament times. Tonight I hope you'll be coming along to Pentecost Praise at St Mary's to celebrate with other Christians in the town the coming of the Holy Spirit. And I would encourage you to come and you know, as Helen was saying earlier, you know, we're not dead, we're alive. And to be uh, surrounded with other Christians as part of the church in our town, you know, we are alive as, as a body in, in, in Luton. And I'd really encourage you to come. But I want to tell you about the first time that I went to Pentecost Praise. It was 36 years ago, and it was held in St Albans Abbey. And I went with Brendan and another friend. I'd been a Christian for about a year. It was all good. Wonderful worship and lovely to experience being together with other Christians until suddenly something changed. There were nuns dancing in the aisles. People were crying out and praising God and then the most beautiful singing just absolutely filled the place but with sounds and words we didn't understand. Do you remember? <laughs> we were transfixed. What on earth was going on? 
I think the three of us had an idea. It was something to do with the Holy Spirit. It was beautiful, but weird, and we couldn't wait to get out of the place. I continued to live my Christian life. I believed in Jesus, was following him, serving him, praying to him, and seeing my prayers answered. But I determined that I wasn't going to have anything to do with this Holy Spirit business. And we hadn't actually received very much teaching at that time. It seemed weird to me. And anyway, I was doing fine. Thank you. Of course, what I hadn't realized was that the Holy Spirit had been working in me all along. From the time when I just felt a niggle that Brenda and I should find a church after we were married, that was the work of the Holy Spirit, to the time when I became a believer, when the Holy Spirit came to live in my heart. I continued to be resistant, though. Some people would say stubborn. And perhaps a little fearful. And it was perhaps ten years or so later that God perhaps said, I've had enough of this messing about and brought me to a point where his Holy Spirit was very evident, very powerful, and fully released in me. See, I discovered that something more that the new believers in Acts had discovered. So what was it that I discovered? What were some of the changes that took place? And what have Christians throughout the ages discovered? What have you discovered? So here are just a few of the aspects of the work of the Holy Spirit that were were sort of new to me. So the Holy Spirit is the presence of Jesus. It's not just a force or something weird, but Jesus' spirit left with his believers as promised in John 14 and Acts 1. He confirms in our hearts that we are God's children, loved, valued, precious. And for the first time, I just knew the overwhelming love of God in a new way. The Holy Spirit opens up the Bible in an amazing way. And I'm sure you've perhaps experienced that time when you've read a passage, one that you've perhaps read many times before, but perhaps passed over. But this time it just comes alive. It's like you've never read it before, and suddenly you understand. I remember sitting shortly after um, this this experience I'd had with our vicar at the time, and I had a Bible in front of me, and saying, look, look, have you read this? Have you read this? It was a passage in Titus. And he sat there and very graciously said, yes, yes, I have actually read it. But it was so exciting to me. And it, it was a common passage. The, Bible, the Holy Spirit teaches us, not only by opening up the Bible in a new way, but he teaches us the truth about God, about Jesus, and about what's to come. We suddenly get a new revelation about God, or about a situation we're dealing with, or about our plans. Sometimes this comes through the Bible but it may also be through words, pictures, dreams, or through nature. We sometimes link this with the gift of prophecy. We may have a new discernment about a situation or a person. And I can remember that very clearly. God showed me something about somebody, which is a church we needed to know. In John 15, it says, I will send you the advocate, the spirit of truth. He will come to you from the Father and will testify all about me. In 16 says, when the spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all truth. He will not speak on his own, but will tell you what he has heard. He will tell you about the future. He'll give you guidance and direction. And then linked with with the above, Holy Spirit gives wisdom. He gives us direction. He gives vision. And we need to be praying that the Holy Spirit be speaking to Tim, giving him God's vision for our church going forward. Perhaps a bit more uncomfortably, the Holy Spirit convicts and shows us where we're going wrong in our actions and our attitudes. But he also reassures us of God's forgiveness if if we repent. And then the Holy Spirit transforms us, changes our behaviours and our attitudes in ways which we simply can't do on our own, but we have to let him. And then he'll develop in us the, the fruit of the Spirit. The Holy Spirit also gives gifts for service, and I'm sure you're familiar with some of those listed in 1 Corinthians and Romans. Teachers, pastors, evangelists, prophets, gifts of healing, mercy, knowledge, even administration. All spiritual gifts given to be used in serving God and his church. So these are just some of the things that the Holy Spirit gets involved in. I'm sure you can list others, some of the things that I discovered. The point is, though, that our Christian lives don't stand still. There's more. 
And that's where today's reading comes in. Do you want more of Jesus in your life? Do you not fully understand how much God loves you? Would you like a particular gift from God to help you to serve him better? And where are we on that journey with Jesus? If we believe that Jesus died and rose again so that we may have eternal life, have we invited him to become Lord of our life? And if we have, have we asked his Holy Spirit to be released in our lives? Have we experienced the power of the Holy Spirit? Doesn't have to be dramatic. Can't promise any nuns dancing in the aisles tonight. But have we known that light bulb moment as you read God's word? Have we heard his voice, known his direction, received new gifts, become more like Jesus? Have we had dreams, dreams or visions or words of knowledge? Maybe you feel a bit stale. You've known the presence of Jesus more acutely in the past, but now it's as if you've been doing this for ages and nothing much is happening. Are you hungering for more of God? Well, the good news is that there's more. I'm going to read the first part of today's reading again. As I do so, I'd just like you to think about where you are. Are you hungry for more? Oh God, you are my God. I earnestly search for you. My soul thirsts for you. My whole body longs for you in this parched and weary land where there is no water. I have seen you in your sanctuary and gazed upon your power and glory. Your unfailing love is better than life itself. How I praise you. I will praise you as long as I live, lifting up my hands to you in prayer. You satisfy me more than the richest feast. I will praise you with songs of joy. Now the good news is that today is a special day. People often call uh, Pentecost Sunday the birthday of the church. And as a birthday, it's also a day for gifts. And I've got some gift cards here and I'm going to pass them round. I'll just start that off. So when you've got a card, you see it's got a little gift on the front, and inside it says to, and it says with love from God. So I'd like you to write your name where it says to, and then on the other side, write down the something more that you'd like from God, and take it home. And pray about it during the week. And wouldn't it be good if we had some testimonies about what God has done in the next few weeks? You see, God loves to give gifts to his children. And it's okay to ask him for a new gift. 1 Corinthians 14 says, Follow the way of love and eagerly desire gifts of the Spirit, especially prophecy. So do you want to hear God's voice? Through dreams and visions, through words and impressions through his words speaking directly to you, then ask him. Would you like to be able to speak to people more easily and often about Jesus? Then ask for the gift of evangelism. Would you like the Spirit's help when you pray? Then ask him for the gift of intercession or of tongues. Would you just like his reassurance that you are truly loved, forgiven and accepted? Then tell him what you need. Perhaps you're struggling with an issue or an attitude in your life. Perhaps you're finding it hard to forgive someone. Or you're finding yourself getting angry or bad-tempered too often. It's the Holy Spirit's job to do in us what we can't possibly do for ourselves, to make us more like Jesus. So write that down. What would you like from God today? Write it on the card, take it home, and then pray for it. And then like the disciples, wait for it. Wait for that something more. Of course, when God gives us a new gift, we may need to learn how to use it. 
just as we may need to read the instruction manual and practice if we receive, say, a new iPod. If we've asked for a gift of evangelism, we're not going to be Billy Graham overnight. And like all good gifts, they're best shared. So we need to use our God-given gifts to help build up the church. Just ask uh, Dean to put a slide up for me. Or Chris to put a slide up, or somebody to put a slide up. And this is just to finish, and it's just to help you to remember today's theme. Does anybody remember who this is? Sorry? Jimmy Cricket. He was an Irish comedian. Do you remember him? And if you remember him, you might remember what his catchphrase was. Anybody remember what his catchphrase was? Sorry? No, he used to say, and there's more. And there's more. So I just want you to remember that, and there's more. Now, I haven't touched upon the theology of being born again, or a second baptism, or a second experience. I'd just like us all to focus on the fact that God wants us to have more. Are you hungry for that? Don't be like me and wait 10 years before allowing God to release his Holy Spirit in your heart. Ask him today to do something more in your life. Amen. Thank you, Helen. <clears throat> Just thinking, how do we respond um, in an appropriate way? Um, yeah, let's just pray first. Um, Father God, you have given us so much this morning to think about. And Father, we uh, just ask this morning that you would help us to respond to that word. To take that card that Helen gave us and to write in it just what we would like from you. And Father, we just pray that you would just help us just to look for that and wait for it with expectant hearts because we know that you're a God who does answer our prayers. And Father, we see you move in big and small ways and we just thank you for that. And Father, as we go through the week, help us to go through with those expectant hearts. Amen. Um, I'm just wondering, um, really, does anybody have anything at all that they might want to come and share in response to what they've heard this morning? Um, just thinking um, about, being, about God being in the small and the big things. Um, I wasn't really going to share this. It is, in some ways, it was really quite small, but... Um, Doreen and I have been away this week and um, we were queuing up in a cafe behind somebody and um, one of, it was a, three young girls and they paid with a pound coin and it was the wrong one, it was an old one and the girl said, I'm really sorry but you need a new one, we, we can't accept old ones anymore and my immediate response was, oh for goodness sake, I've got a pound, you know and I got out the pound because I just felt for these girls. I felt they were from, a, from another country and they didn't know what the lady was saying. And I thought, it's just a pound. And I gave the pound over and um, didn't think any more of it. And then we moved along and it was my turn to pay. And it just blew us away because the girl said, oh, that was such a kind thing for you to have done. I'm giving you a discount she said, I'm, I'm giving you 20% discount. So I thought, oh, oh, thank you very much. <laughs> and I went off and sat down all embarrassed. And then a bit later on, um, Doreen and I were drinking our coffee, and I got out my receipt, and I'd actually got back like 100 and something percent. You know? <laughs> it's like, but it wasn't, I mean, it seems a small thing, but it had affected the girl behind the counter, and I hadn't expected, I just paid the pounds, you know. And it affected us hugely that she had blessed us in that way. And it was like, and I don't know what happened to the girls. They went off embarrassed because they paid <laughs> for their packet of crisps or whatever it was they were trying to buy. But 
It's in the small things, isn't it? It's in the everyday detail that God turns up with his Holy Spirit. He does come in big and powerful ways, but he comes in the everyday things, and I just want to encourage us not to miss it. So does anyone want to come and share? Bob, come and share with us. <laughs> Thank you. It's not often that we hear on the media Bob, Bob, the mic. Hello. It's not often we hear about these things on the media, but I was really um, pleased and so impressed this morning to listen to uh, the Archbishop, actually, Welby, um, his initiative of bringing the message, the good news, and, uh, and to the churches throughout the world all denominations should pray for the Holy Spirit now that apparently was some uh, while ago and the response to that has been great many leaders have come and expressed that the churches throughout the world would join together you know, this is, a, you know, you, you, when you were saying on small things, this is a big thing. God's in everything, isn't he? And the good news is that uh, all the churches are praying exactly for this world in all its complexity and all its suffering and all its, well, secularism that would come and be impressed and that the Lord would give the Holy Spirit to the world and that we as Christians would be praying for that and we have and we do and we will because that is I believe and many uh, the thoughts came through this morning on, on the BBC radio that that is the only thing that's really going to change this world and it's going to be good it's going to be wonderful it's going to be good news for everybody you know we pray for Small things, that's right and proper. But here is the thing that we should all, perhaps just during the week, give a prayer here and there that the Holy Spirit would come to the church, to the world, or through the church, to the world, if you like. And it was, I was really impressed this morning. I believe that there's uh, some activity at, uh, this afternoon in Trafalgar Square um, I think there's a big church there um, as well, but uh, that uh, hopefully the, the initiative will continue. I'm sure it's going on in Luton, we hear about it and, and so forth. And if we're not able to get out and do things, we have a heart and soul, we can pray, can't we? Lord, in your mercy, bring the Holy Spirit to us all again. Bring the Holy Spirit to the world to the church, by all means, of course, but to the world. The world needs it, doesn't it? Wouldn't it be wonderful to see the media change with the good news of Jesus Christ? Thank you.